here YouTube, I'm back again today for another weekly video log. It is February 15th, 2016. I hope you're doing well. I'm doing very well. I'm very excited because I'm about to talk about Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition, my favorite game of all time. So, those of you who are used to my weekly video logs, this format is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to be going over my top nine favorite Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition races and then talking about the games that I got a chance to play and that I got in the mail this past week. And uh, so if you don't have any interest in Twilight Imperium, just skip to the tail end of this. So why did I do this list? I did this list because this is my favorite game of all time. And a lot of people, uh, when you first come into the game, sometimes you actually get to choose which race you are. And this would be very helpful because when, you're, when you first start the game and you're looking at these races, you're like, I don't understand what any of this crap means. I'm just going to pick this guy because it looks cool. So hopefully, if this is your first time playing, maybe this will get you a feel for which race you might want or might not want. And if you know the game already, you can just call me an idiot and tell me I'm wrong or tell me which ones you like the best. So before I get started, I do want to mention I'm going to be going over all the races that are in the base game and the two expansions. And I'm going to exclude the Lazix, uh, which is a special one in the second expansion for scenario-based gameplay, even though it would be really cool to be the Lazix. So, uh, Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition, every person is going to have their own unique space race, which has completely asymmetrical powers, and I wanted to make this a top five list, and I very quickly realized that that was not going to be an easy task for me, because there are 17 races here, and I think I like 11 of the 17, and I really like 9 of the 17, which should tell you how well balanced and how much fun some of these are. So I'm going to be going over the different races in no particular order, and I'm going to be telling you their special abilities and why I really like them as a character. So the first race I'm going to talk about is the Emrites of Hakan, which are the lion people. And I'm only going to read over the special abilities on here that really, uh, the ones that I like. So first and foremost, your trades do not require approval during trade negotiation. This means you are going to be making tons of money throughout the game, especially if you're playing at a player count where every single one of the uh, one through eight is going to be taken because you know trade will be taken every time, which means you're going to be rolling in cash. Also, you do not need to spend a command counter to execute the secondary ability of the trade action, and you receive one additional trade good. So that's just more money that you're going to be able to spend on whatever you like, building things or spending it for technology. So I really like playing with the MRTs of Hakan. He gives you a lot of flexibility. And then last but not least, my favorite aspect of this is that during the status phase, you may trade action cards with other players, and this this is one of my favorite things about Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition. Now, the way we play, there's not too much trading generally. But when I get the lion guy, you better believe I am trying to wheel, I am trying to deal, I'm trying to make negotiations and alliances, and I'm telling people, all right, I will give you three action cards, and these are the three action cards. And I might not even tell them what they are for one of yours, because if I don't need those three action cards, then maybe I can get something good off the scrap heap. I like the trading aspect a lot. I think it really adds a good deal of fun and uniqueness to Twilight Imperium, which, you know, there's already so much going on in the game, I just like adding that extra little layer. So the Emrites of Khan, one I really enjoy playing. Next, we have the Yin Brotherhood, which has, without a doubt, some of the coolest special abilities if you know how to use them. If you are a newer Twilight Imperium player, I probably wouldn't recommend playing with them because you really kind of have to plan to their strengths. So, uh, before an invasion combat in which you are the attacker, uh, you may roll one die. On a five plus, your opponent loses one ground force, and you will gain one ground force. So that's really good. And sometimes, in some scenarios, that will actually completely defeat the combat if they just have one person on there to save the land. Uh, immediately before the second round of a space battle, you may discard one of your participating destroyers or cruisers to choose one opposing ship present and immediately inflict one hit on it. This is huge. It does not sound huge if you don't play Twilight Imperium on the regular, but if they have a wounded war sun, you can essentially destroy one of your ships and knock that war sun out because you know that war sun is going to do more than one point of damage. So that special ability should completely change how you send ships into battle, especially if you're going against Dreadnoughts, War Sons, or the, uh, the the one in the second expansion, your own custom race ship. So really like him. Last but not least, once per turn is in action, you may place your control marker on an unexhausted planet card, and uh, until the end of the round, its influence and resource value are reversed. Now that doesn't sound terribly useful, but you got to realize that spending that resource, or spending that uh, 
uh, as an action, if you place the control marker there, say you have Mechatol Rex, that means you're going to switch that around and you're going to get a boatload of resources that you can turn into, you know, uh, what is it, like a Dreadnought you can turn that into, you can get half of a War Sun, you can't really get half of a War Sun, but you can, you can get quite a good deal of cash out of that if you have the triangles to spend on it. So I really enjoy the Yin Brotherhood, but that's one I recommend for only if you're an experienced Twilight Imperium player. Next, I have one that might be my favorite, and that's because I like to turtle a little bit. I won't lie, I'm a little bit of turtle in Twilight Imperium, and that is the Ysarl Tribes. So the Ysarl Tribes, you are allowed to skip your action turn during the action phase. You may not skip two such action turns in a row. So essentially, that means you always get to see what other people are doing before you decide to do anything. Your first turn, skip. Your second turn, maybe a build. Third turn, you skip. The fourth turn, maybe you play your, uh, your your technology or something. Maybe you flip that over, whatever tile you did. Then you skip, and then you do this, and then you skip. And it just lets you see exactly what everyone else is doing before you decide what you want to do, which is incredibly useful, especially if you plan on breaking alliances, which I love to do. The Ursula Tribes is without a doubt my favorite, tri my favorite race to break alliances with, because everybody else has passed, and you you might still have two, three actions to do. Really enjoy it. Uh, other special abilities, you draw one additional action card during every status phase. I love that. I love the action cards. I love how powerful having a huge hand of action cards can be in the right situation. Be like, oh, no, I can do this. Or, oh, oh, I can do that. I love that aspect. And you get extra ones. Uh, you're never limited to a hand size. And then once during every strategy phase, you may look at one other player's hand of action cards. I don't use this too terribly often because when you do that, I feel like it's a little bit of a tell that, hey, I'm going to be attacking you, and I like it to be sneaky, but sometimes it can be useful. Uh, I can think of one particular incident where if I would have been able to look at someone's hand of cards before I attacked them, that would have been fantastic. They had mines set out, and they pretty much destroyed everything I was sending at them. I had like four or five dreadnoughts. And they had a card that destroyed Dreadnoughts. And if I would have saw that card, it would have been a different game. So the Ysirl Tribes, probably my number one. Definitely in my top three, no doubt about it. So the next one is the Necrovirus. Uh, this one is a lot of fun to play with, especially if you like to attack. So you may not vote on political or agenda cards. Okay, a little bit of a bummer, but not a huge deal. When you destroy at least one enemy unit in a space battle or invasion combat, excluding PDS fire, you may copy one free technology card, ignoring all prerequisites. Yes, all the prerequisites that the enemy player has already researched. Limit once per battle. This is huge. This is gigantic. Because you can, especially if you park yourself near a wormhole, you want a little pro tip, you're playing as the necrovirus, try and set it to yourself up so that you have a wormhole connected to the other side of the map. Because then you can attack your neighbors and steal the tech that you really want from them, but then you can also send out a suicide mission to go attack somebody across the map, and if you attack them, you can steal something very useful. I have stolen the War Sun with this one, which is incredibly useful, especially if you're going up against the Emblers of Muat which I will talk about in a minute. But needless to say, the Necrovice is a really fun one to play. Uh, you cannot turtle with this one, though. If you're getting this one, you need to go out and you need to attack. Um, you may not receive technology cards from political, assembly, action, or strategy cards. Anytime you receive a technology card in that way, instead gain three command counters. But that one's a lot of fun to play. That's the Necrovirus. Uh, next, I, I mentioned them a little bit, the Embers of Muat, and uh, anyone who's played Twilight Imperium knows exactly why I'm saying this one, so we'll go over the special abilities. Your War Sons have a base movement of one, so that's actually bad. Normally they start with two, however you can eventually improve it to two with, uh, with the technology. As an action, you may spend one command counter from your strategy allocation area to place two free fighters or one free destroyer in any one system containing one of your War Suns or Space Docks. So if you get War Suns out on the board, that's really useful. Last, your ships may move through, but not may not end their movement in supernova systems, which, uh, depending on the board layout, can be helpful. But the real reason why these guys are in my top nine is pretty obvious. They start with a freaking War Sun. Now granted, it is a slow as dirt War Sun, but you having a War Sun early on makes it so that no one wants to mess with you. If you are expanding with that War Sun, you can pretty much do whatever you want. That first secret objective you have, it's probably going to be pretty easy to accomplish, especially if you can get two War Suns out in a relatively quick 
fashion. But yes, the Embers and Muad, always fun to play with it. I don't know if I've ever seen anyone win with them, but still, you're starting off with a freaking war sign. Uh, with the technology, at least. What's more fun than that? So, we have four left in here. Now, the next one is the Ghost of Cruz. And this one is actually... Um, this one is actually in the second expansion, and these guys are all about the wormholes. And I love the wormholes in Twilight Imperium. I love the unpredictability when someone is near a wormhole, and you're like, all right, are you attacking me, or are you attacking her, or, oh, I guess you could go through that wormhole. Are you attacking them? Like, you never know exactly what somebody near a wormhole is going to do, and I love that. Uh, so, And they're even more unpredictable, because you may treat A and B wormhole systems as if they were adjacent to each other. So you can travel from A to B, and no, not to mention your home planet is a wormhole. Uh, kind of crazy. You may always use wormholes regardless of other game effects or restrictions. They are never off limits to you. And other players may not use A or B wormholes to travel into a system you control. Now my one problem I have with this, and it's a minor quibble, comes in the form of the, uh, where is that tile? There is a tile, yeah, here it is, which is, I believe it's in the second expansion, called the Wormhole Nexus, which is literally just a wormhole with a planet on it. You control it. So if this person controls this planet, no one can ever take it over. Uh, there is no way at all you can take it over, which is a little bit of a bummer, but it, I, I guess it's not a huge deal. But, yeah. I just felt like that's just a tiny slight bit odd, but luckily it's only a 0-3, so they're just a little bit more power politically, but still just something I wanted to mention. But the Ghost of Cruz, once again, never seen anybody win with it, but it's a really cool race that spices things up, and you like it, it's spicy, especially when you're playing an 8-12 to 12 hour game. So, next we got the Winu, and the Winu are all about that technology, and I don't really particularly like their first two ones. You may always add the influence value of your home system planet to your vote, even if it's exhausted, so you're a little bit more power voting. whoop de frickin do Your planets that contain at least one ground force are immune to the local unrest action card. That's kind of useful. It's a nice persistent ability, but it's not the biggest deal in the world. But where the new shine is when it comes to tech. You do not need to spend a command counter to execute the secondary ability of the technology strategy ever which means every single time you will be upgrading your tech. You flat broke, you got no strategy allocation, you got no money, guess what? You're the Winu, you're still going to be upgrading your tech. And the best part about this is if you take the, uh, the first one, if you take the tech card yourself, you're going to be able to do two techs for free, which is just crazy. So you are just a tech monster. You're going to be able to upgrade pretty much whatever you want to whatever you want by the end of the game. So the Winu, if you like tech, look no further. So, next we have the Clan of Sar. Now, I particularly do not like playing as this race, but I love having them out on the board because they are a very interesting, very deadly race. There is the Clan of Sar. I believe they're in the first expansion, and they gain one trade good every time you acquire a new planet. So it is their best interest to expand. And what this means is, if they, when they first start out, they're going to start out with a lot of money, which, as you know, means they're going to be able to build things like dreadnoughts and destroyers and all kinds of stuff like that. But the interesting thing about the Clan of Sar is that their space stocks have a movement of one. Yes, they're going to be able to move their space stocks around the board, uh, and so essentially, your space stocks are never, uh, never, mo they're always mobile. And the thing is, you may fulfill objectives even if you don't control your home system, which is where this makes it so interesting. So what that means is you are allowed to build, uh, move your uh, your space stocks, and you don't have to stay at your, your home system. If you want to move your thing and just kind of set up camp at Mechatol Rex or set up camp right next to somebody, you can do that. Because in normal Twilight Imperium, you have to have your home system to get any victory points at all. Not so much with these guys. So these just kind of, they're like a bang of, uh, gang of bikers just roaming around the galaxy, just hitting people up. Oh, I need money. It's nothing personal. I just got to attack your planet. And it's a lot of fun playing with them in the game, as long as they're not messing with you. Stay the hell away from me, Clanisar. All right, we got one more, and that is the Universities of Jolnar. And uh, you receive minus one on your combat rolls. That really does kind of stink. When executing the secondary ability of the technology strategy, you may execute both its primary ability and the secondary ability. So what does that mean? That means you never want to take tech. Uh, essentially, that means every time someone does tech, if you can afford the strategy allocation marker and the money to do it, you're going to gain 
two pieces of tech, which is very, very valuable. Also, you may spend the command counter from your strategy allocation to immediately reroll any of your die rolls. So that kind of makes up for that negative one at the very top. Not to mention, you are going to start with four, count them, four yes technology. So these guys are all about the technology, and you couldn't tell I love the technology. So those are my top nine Twilight Imperium third edition races and why I love them. Let me know in the comments below if you agree, if you disagree, what's your favorite race? And yes, there were a couple of them that I like that, that I didn't include, like the Sardak Nor, your C plus one on all your combat rolls. I love having that one, but I had to whittle it down to nine. I couldn't do a top ten list, no way. Uh, but that has been this list. So let's talk about the games that I got in the mail, the games I got a chance to play this past week. The first one, if you take anything away from this, take away Lie from a uh, pack of games. So they sent me a bunch of their games to review. I think I've reviewed two of them now, and this is without a doubt my favorite one that I've played so far. It is outstanding. It is fantastic. It will never leave my uh, my book bag. Uh, it, it's just, it's Liar's Dice, but with cards. It's lightning quick. It's simple. It's got player elimination, but it's so much fun that people don't mind and, and it's just outstanding. It is essentially just uh, BS. You're going to call BS or you're going to keep the BS up. I really enjoyed this game. That is live from Packet Game. Highly recommend that one. But I will say only if you're playing, say, three, four, five, six players. Two players is yeah, And three players, yeah. But four, five, six, great. So, the next game that I got a chance, and you'll actually see a review of this one probably on Saturday because it'll be super easy to review, is Mix and Match Robbers from Haba Games. Haba Games was nice enough to send me some games. Score, since I'm a teacher, I love those sort of things. And uh, this is a really simple matching game where you're going to be rolling a die and then flipping over cards and then trying to find the character that was created by you flipping over said cards. And it's perfectly enjoyable as a young children's slash family game. And, uh, just Hava did it once again. The only real cons I had with it is it has micro cards, which can be a little bit annoying. But uh, but I enjoyed it. So mix and match robbers from Hava. If you're looking for a uh, small, compact, portable, cheap children slash family game, this is definitely one that you might want to check out. I think children age three plus could probably give this a whirl, no problem at all. I will say though, once you get up to around age 10, 11, 12 plus, I think you might want to look at some other Hava games. Next one I checked out was the Institute for Magical Arts from Dr. Finn's Games. And uh, this is a two-player head-to-head uh, game where it's got a lot of mechanisms. You're going to be trying to uh, place, you're going to be rolling dice and then allocating those dice around the board with power stones and trying to gain more power stones. And you're going to be trying to have area control aspects and there's a little push your luck aspect in the game because there's a portal that can gain you victory points. I enjoyed it. It was a really enjoyable two-player game. Um, if you ask me for a point rating, I'd say about an 8.3, 8.4. Very solid game. If you play two-player games routinely, this is definitely one I recommend checking out. It's small, compact, portable, too, which is always nice. The artwork's pretty good. Components are nice. It's easy to learn. And, uh, yeah, there's, nothing, there's no real holes I can poke in this game. It's uh, perfectly enjoyable. That's the Institute for Magical Arts from Dr. Finn's Games. If you routinely play two-player games, definitely recommend checking it out. The other game I got in the mail was Mr. Game, the chaotic party game. Now, I don't know too much about this game. I know a little bit. Uh, my buddy Eric, who is uh, also my camera guy slash editor when you see nice videos, uh, put this as his number one missed anticipated game of Gen Con last year. But apparently it's a party game where the rules are ever-changing and people in the game get to make the rules. I'm not quite sure. Hopefully I'll be able to give it a whirl this weekend and give you my thoughts on it next week. Uh, so that's Mr. Game, the party game. Last but not least, I was able to get my hands on this one. Another one Hobbit sent me was my very first game's Flower Fairy. And I will probably be doing next week uh, my favorite races from this game as well, just like my Twilight Imperium. Uh, no, this is uh, in the My First Games line, and I've done a couple of their reviews for the My First Games. They're fantastic. they got big, chunky wooden components, which actually I can probably open it up and show you real quick. Uh, but I have Hungry as a Bear, and I have the uh, I have the Cock-a-Doodle-Doo one night in the farm, which is really great. But these are for kids that are very, very young, and I'm going to take this in my classroom, and I'll probably work with some of my kids who don't get to play any games at home. Those are the kinds that I focus on. But I don't have any quote unquote girl game so this will be great but as you can see look at the size of those wooden components those things are huge 
uh, nice chunky wooden pieces, and uh, I'm sure the little girls in my class are going to go crazy over this. Mr. Forrest, can we play the fairy game? Oh, I'm going to be hearing that for like the next few weeks. But anywho, I'm excited to try it out, and you'll probably see a review of this in the next couple weeks, because I'm sure this one will not be too much of a difficult review. So, that has been my week in review, slash my top nine Twilight Imperium 3rd edition races. If you enjoyed the list format, let me know, and if you have any ideas for lists that I should make in the future pertaining to specific games, also let me know in the comments below. And as always, thanks for your time, YouTube.